Thank you for um, thank you for heckling me for many years because I'm really happy to be here. I'm uh, really happy to be surrounded by people who work in security like I do, because our work matters, and I'll speak about that a little bit. So yeah, my name is Mikko. I live in Helsinki, Finland, and I've been uh, working with computer security forever, basically forever. And and I think we're all very lucky to be getting feedback. <laughs> is it better here? Maybe it is. OK, cool. We're all very lucky because we've seen massive shifts in the world around us, good shifts. The internet came about during our lifetime. During our lifetime, every single computer has gone online. And that's easy to say. But it's, it's hard to actually understand what it means. But let me, let me illustrate this to you. Indeed, I've worked with F-Secure in, since 1991. I was hired as employee number six back then. And I was hired as a programmer. And when I would go to the office in the morning, it was very similar to going to the office in the morning today. I mean, we have, of course, much more people today. But basically, everybody's sitting at their desks, banging at the keyboard all day long. All the desks have PCs and Macs. Exactly the same thing in 1991. We had PCs and Macs. But in 1991, our PCs and Macs were not online. And when I say they're not online, I don't just mean that they were not on the internet, because obviously they were not on the internet in 1991. They were not even connected to each other. We did not have a local area network. So when you were working with your files on one computer and you needed to move them to another computer, you would uh, use these. Remember these? Some of you have never seen these. <laughs> this is the uh, USB thumb drive of 1990s. This is a dual density, two-sided, so it's uh, one to two megabytes. It's a big one. And it's actually infected. This is a, a real infected floppy from our archives. Because we've been collecting and saving malware for, well, more than a quad, quarter of a century. So during our lifetime, we've seen this change where all computers were connected to each other. And now we are starting to see the next revolution, which is everything else getting connected to the internet. If it uses electricity, it will be online. That's the way it's going to be. This is the IoT revolution, and it's scary as hell. But then again, the internet revolution was scary as hell uh, anyway. Obviously, internet exposed us to completely new kinds of risks. Because before the internet, you didn't have to worry about thieves and criminals from far away. You didn't have to worry about you know, criminals from Ukraine or criminals from Brazil, because they were too far away. They wouldn't fly over to Richmond to break into your houses or to steal your cars. But of course, today you have to worry about them because they are as close to you as they are to any other victim. Internet took away geography. It took away distances. It took away the borders. But I think we would all agree that the internet brought us more good things than bad things. Clearly, there's been so much business, so much communication, so much entertainment that we have received from the internet that we would take the the downsides any time we forget such big upsides. And I would like to think, I would like to wish that the same thing will apply to the next revolution, to the IoT revolution. Because it's quite clear that we will see new risks. We've already seen great examples of the kinds of risks that IoT brings. But I hope when we're having RVASEC 2027 in 10 years, or something like that. Then we can look back to the history of IoT and we can say the same thing, that IoT brought us lots of risks, but clearly the upsides are much bigger than the downsides. But we do have to note that that's just a wish. We don't actually know if that's going to happen or not. So we're lucky. We've seen one revolution and we will get to see another. One. In, in fact, if we are really lucky, we get to see the next revolution after the IoT revolution. And that's going to be the AI revolution, artificial intelligence, general AI. 
And of course, AI is a buzzword, and you can use it for many different things. In fact, at our labs at F-Secure, we've been running AI or machine learning for almost eight years now. Our systems, which collect malware and bring them in, and then run them in virtual machines, make the decisions on their own. And it's a learning system. It looks at hundreds of thousands of malware samples every single day and tries to make the decision if this is a good one or a bad one. Like, should we block this or should we not block this? And that's a learning system. So you can use machine learning for good. Obviously, we, we, we use it to bring better security. But when we get to discussions about general AI, then things, of course, get really scary. And I'm, I'm a believer in the notion that when we reach general AI, it's either going to be really great or really awful. General AI, if it's good, it can you know, solve all of our problems. Solve problems of pollution or hunger or poverty. It's going to be trivial for a superior intelligence to solve those. But if, it's, if it goes bad, then it goes really bad. So it's going to be a pretty big thing. Probably the biggest thing in mankind's history. And with any luck, we'll get to see that. And the first implications that will come out of like general AI, I believe, will be things like programming programs. I actually spoke to a startup, I think on Monday, yeah, on Monday, which was building these programming programs. In fact, years ago, I wrote a programming program, a program which wrote, in this case, C programs. And those programs would compile. But they really sucked, of course. But you can think about this. Let's say I would drop everything. I would do anything else except try to make my programming program better. All right? I put all my effort into making it better. It's going to get better pretty quickly. And if I spend years at it, it's going to be pretty good. So at some stage, it's going to become as good as I am. If, if we imagine how good I am as a programmer, my program would start to reach that level. And then maybe after, I don't know, 30 years, 40 years of work, it would be as good as me. And that's the last day I would ever have to write a program. In fact, it's the last day anybody would have to write a program. Every single programmer would immediately be out of a job. Why? Because that program would write a better version of itself, which would write a better version of itself, which would write a better version of itself. In 10 seconds, it would have skyrocketed. In 10 minutes, it would be beyond our capability to understand what it does. This is what this AI explosion means. And by the way, if that would really happen, and like I said, there are companies working on this, if that would really happen, we would get rid of vulnerabilities. Right now, all the problems we fight with are either humans doing stupid stuff or technical problems. And we will get rid of those technical problems. Vulnerabilities will go away. Because when programs are no longer written by human beings, human beings won't be there to make mistakes, which means there won't be any bugs which means there won't be any vulnerabilities, which means there won't be any exploits. Or if there will be bugs, they will be so goddamn complex that we will never be able to exploit them. So there are very clear implications to our line of work from these machine learning and AI systems. So great revolutions in the work, exciting times. After 26 years of working at the same company, I've never had a boring day. And that's a pretty remarkable thing to say. Quarter of a century, I've never had a boring day at work. Why? Because this keeps changing. Our enemy keeps on changing. And it's work that matters. When I was a young boy, I always told my mother that I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a doctor. Why? Because I wanted to help people. Then later, it turns out I didn't like to look at blood. And if you don't like looking at blood, you won't become a doctor. So I didn't become a doctor. I became a geek and a nerd instead. But in a way, I'm as close as you can get to being a doctor in our field. I mean, I enjoy what I do because what we're doing is that we are helping people. Our work matters. People come to us with the kind of problems they would have no hope in hell solving by themselves. And we can solve those problems. We can help them. That feels good. And that's, very, that's a remarkable thing. And that's one thing that keeps me getting out of bed in the morning. So like I said, we've seen 
the internet changed the world. It has brought us great things, but of course, it has brought us bad things. And we get reminded about the bad things regularly. We got reminded about the worst things on the internet three weeks ago with the WannaCry episode. And this was quite remarkable. Not because it was a ransom trojan. Ransom trojans are not a new phenomenon. The very first ransomware we ever found was in 1989. 1989, not 1999, 1989. This is almost 30 years old. In 1989, we found a ransom trojan which was being shipped in the mail to victims in a letter with a floppy, which had a useful application which you would install and then when you would install the application, after three days it would encrypt your files and ask you to pay to get your files back. And since Bitcoin didn't exist in 1989, they were asking you to pay by wiring a money order to Panama. So this phenomenon isn't new. What really changed the landscape, of course, is cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin in particular. But WannaCry was such a special case because it was a combination of a ransomware with a worm. Now we never see worms anymore. Worms replicate on their own, which means they typically get out of control. And WannaCry got out of control. This is the Friday three weeks ago. And those of you who've been around will remember how similar this looks to the spreading patterns of Slammer or Blaster or Sasser. And by the way, Slammer from 2003 still has the world record in spreading speed. It scanned every single IPv4 address, 42 billion addresses, in 17 minutes. So fr from the moment when it was launched, in 17 minutes it was finished. It had already infected every system it could infect. It had already scanned the whole internet. Well, the whole internet as far as you can. And we all saw the headlines after WannaCry. WannaCry was especially bad in Europe. And this was a time zone thing. WannaCry spread for five hours. Those were very early morning hours here in the United States and South America. It was very late in the evening in most of Asia. But it was business hours in Europe. And that's why most of the affected companies and parties and organizations were European, like the UK healthcare system, the NHS, which had remarkable problems. However, if you want to look at the bright side, for once, our medical data was strongly encrypted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but speaking seriously about things like these, when you have healthcare systems and hospitals um, shut down, I mean, you have ambulance cars queuing outside of the hospital because they can't get in because the computers are down. Um, Obviously, this is serious, and I actually asked our, um, our people at our UK office to try to collect the, uh, try to see if the death statistics are public information in UK, to see if there was a peak three weeks ago. Like, did more people die during WannaCry? Turns out the statistics are public, but you get them six months afterwards, so we will see in a couple of months if this actually created a peak in deaths. It's per per perfectly possible people died because of this. Now, ransomware is unique in the sense that every victim sees that they are infected. When you get hit by a keylogger, you don't see anything. When you get hit by a credit card uh, stealer, you'll only see it from your credit card bill afterwards. Same thing with botnets, same thing with banking trojans. But ransom trojans show you the ransom note. And this also means that when computers which are public get hit, then the public will see that they are hit. So we saw things like uh, this. This is a uh, clothes shop in Spain, and their door is infected by WannaCry. This is a fuel pump infected by WannaCry. This is a mall information system infected by WannaCry. This is from the Frankfurt train station. This is the timetable information display infected by WannaCry. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that, yeah, that's pretty bad, but that's just the time display thing. It's pretty bad, but it's not the end of the world because surely this thing here is not connected to the train control system. Here's the train control system. <laughs> now, I told you WannaCry only spread for five hours. 
And you might have heard about a kill switch that was used to stop the spreading of WannaCry after five hours. So it started around, obviously in Spain when this started, it started around one o'clock. And it was finished by, uh, by, five, uh, by five or six p.m. So let me explain this, this um, kill switch thing to you. Because it turns out that there is no kill switch. The way ransom Trojans, basically all Trojans and malware today work, is that they try to avoid automated analysis. I just told you we're running machine learning systems in our labs, and these systems collect samples automatically. We right, right now have around 750 servers surfing the internet, trying to get infected. Running, I don't know, Windows XP service back one, surfing the internet with IE6, with Flash and Java enabled and then surfing porn and pirate sites and clicking on every link. And as you might imagine, they get infected all the time. In reality, they are not running Windows XP. In reality, they are running hardened versions of CentOS Linux, but they pretend to be old Windows computers so they would get infected, so we can collect the samples and throw them into our analysis systems, where we then execute them and simulate an internet environment for them so they would work, and then we make the automated decisions. Now, malware authors know this, and quite a few malware samples we find are trying to detect, that, am I being analyzed? And if it figures out that it's being analyzed, then it won't do anything bad. And our learning system thinks it's good because it didn't do anything bad. So how do they figure out whether it's being analyzed or not? Well, it depends. Some of them actually look for virtual machine names. Some of them look for specific wallpapers in the virtual machines because they figured out what wallpapers are in the background of some malware analysis labs. Some try to detect emulation environments or VMware or whatever. The way um, WannaCry tried to detect if it's on the real internet or in a simulated internet is that it tried connecting to this DNS name. It tried resolving this DNS name, this domain, and this domain doesn't exist. So it should not resolve to any IP. But for example, our analysis systems, when you try resolving any domain name, we always resolve. We always give you an IP address, and there actually is always a web server there. Because we've learned that this is the best way for malware to work. If, not, if it doesn't get online, it typically wouldn't do much. But if it gets online and believes it's in, on the internet, it actually executes further. And for example, if a piece of malware tries connecting to google.com and makes a search, it actually gets results. It's not the real google.com, it's a simulated google.com, but things like that are built into our systems. So, for example, in our system, if you would try resolving that domain, we would answer with an IP. And in the real world, this domain doesn't exist. It should not resolve to an IP. So this is how it knows. If that domain resolves to an IP, I am being analyzed, so I won't do anything bad. This was what the code in WannaCry did. Around 3 p.m. on that Friday, a UK researcher, a guy called Marcus, you might know him as Malware Tech, he was looking at the code and he saw a reference to this domain. He didn't know what it was. He assumed it's a uh, CNC server. But he realized it's, it's, it's available for registration. So he bought it for $9. Then maybe half an hour later, we realized that, holy hell, this thing isn't spreading anymore. It just stopped spreading. What changed? And then we realized that you know, somebody's registered this domain, which is referenced in the code, and it no longer, now it assumes that every real computer is an analysis computer, and it won't do anything bad. This is the kill switch. There was no kill switch. There was an anti-emulation feature in WannaCry, which was used by him. And he, Marcus, he would deserve a medal. And I'm not joking about this. He saved the world, didn't he? He stopped the outbreak in its tracks after just a couple of hours. He didn't realize at the time what he was doing, but this is what he does. He looks at malware and he sees available domains. He always registers them just in case it's useful. In this case, it was very useful. So yeah, I don't know if your president gives out medals to foreigners, but... Uh,
So researchers at Google went looking for earlier samples of WannaCry. This is what we often do. We try to find like alpha or beta versions of malware when it's a big case. And they, they have the biggest malware repository in the world. It's called Virus Total. And uh, they went searching for all earlier samples and they found the sample here on the left. And that was interesting because it had a decryption loop which was identical to the sample on the right. And the sample on the right is two years old, which links WannaCry to this sample. And this sample was involved with the SWIFT attack, which happened two years ago. The attack against international banking networks in which the attacker tried stealing almost a billion dollars. Billion with a B. A lot of money. They succeeded in stealing around 100 million in four different heists targeting different international banks. And we can link this attack, an earlier attack, which happened in 2014, because this attack was connecting to a server and logging in with a user credentials and a password. This password, which was used, the same account with the same password, was used in completely unrelated attack in 2014. And that attack was an attack against a movie studio in Hollywood. That was the Sony Pictures attack which happened because they were just about to release a movie in which, spoiler alert, Kim Jong-un gets killed. This is the, the interview movie. That's Kim Jong-un, he's in a chopper which is about to be shot down by a tank and uh, he dies in a fiery death. North Korea, whose dictator Kim Jong-un is, protested Violent, very vocally about this, that they don't like a movie in which their dictator is killed. And then Sony Pictures got hacked. And I do realize Sony is a sponsor of ours, so greetings to Sony. <laughs> but this is Sony Pictures, it's completely different. This is the movie studio. So when this thing happened, when the Sony Pictures hack happened, US intelligence agencies very quickly made a public statement. Uh, it was the NS, well, the statement was, um, I believe, done by the CIA. But later on, as the statement was being discussed, it was quite clear that the information was actually coming from the NSA. And when this statement was made that, you know, Sony Pictures was hacked by the government of North Korea, I was really skeptical. Like, really? Like this? Can this really be real life? I mean, seriously? And if this really is true, how on earth can you know? How can you know? Because we all know that cyber attacks have this deniability problem. We never have the smoking gun. This is why governments like cyber attacks. Cyber attacks, cyber attacks. I still remember when cyber meant cyber sex. You know? Want a cyber? <laughs> that's, that's why it's so funny when generals speak about cybering. It's like, yeah. <laughs> Nevertheless, governments are interested in cyber because cyber attacks are effective, affordable, and deniable. Affordable, effective, deniable. That's a great combination in a weapon, especially the deniability part. And then two weeks later, we learned how your intelligence agencies were able to make the call. Because New York Times broke the story. Turns out your guys had hacked the North Koreans and were watching them do it. And this changes the story. It changes the story from those goddamn North Koreans hacking companies here in USA to those goddamn North Koreans are hacking companies here in USA, and we know because we hacked them. However, if we believe that Sony Pictures was hacked by North Korea, then we have fairly strong evidence linking that to SWIFT. And if we believe SWIFT was the work of North Korea, then we have fairly strong evidence linking that to WannaCry. And I know this is incredible. Like, do we really have governments on this planet which are willing to, first of all, steal money from other governments like they did with SWIFT? Second of all, 
distribute ransomware to steal money from people all over the world. Sounds incredible. Doesn't sound something that would really happen. I actually went to Wikipedia to take a look at the annual budget of North Korea. The, the budget for the whole country is four billion. All right, four billion. So when they were trying to steal a billion with the SWIFT attack, that would be a quarter of their annual budget. So if they are trying to fix their budget deficit by hacking, I don't know, but it's pretty creative if, if this is what we're talking about. And I don't think there would be any other government on the planet which would be willing to do this. But North Korea is not a normal government. In fact, we know from public sources they've been involved with other kinds of crime to fund their country, including drug trade, including printing fake money, printing fake dollars. Have you heard of super dollars? You can Google them up. They are $100 bills being printed by the National Printing Press of the North Korea. I don't know of any other government which would print fake money of another government. The, the previous case where I know this happened was during the Second World War, where the Brits were printing fake German marks and then dropping them from bomber planes to Germany to try to cause, and actually did cause an inflation because everybody became a millionaire because there was money coming from, raining from the sky. So if we believe they're able to do this, then it's maybe easier to believe they might have been doing things like SWIFT and WannaCry as well. Now, WannaCry was a failure. They managed to collect payments from 300 victims, which is a very small number. Most of those didn't even pay the full amount of $300 or $600 that was asked. And most of the victims who paid did not get their files back. It was a very poorly written ransom trojan. It was hard to maintain, hard to configure, hard to use. It was a failure. Even with the rise in Bitcoin valuation, which is unrelated, I believe, they only still made less than $200,000, which is a failure. And it's a massive amount of damage for very little gain. And also what they did was that they made a lot of the old school ransom trojan gangs really angry. Because Ransom Trojan gangs, and we track right now quite a few gangs, they had a reputation that they deliver. Like if you pay, you get your files back. And WannaCry destroyed their good reputation. Because now people know, they only remember WannaCry, and WannaCry didn't deliver. In fact, we've been tracking Ransom Trojan families for six years now. It's a map of the different families. Actually, I can only fit to a slide half of the map. Here's the whole map. There's quite a few gangs out there making this. The only one coming from North Korea is WannaCry. Basically, almost all of the rest of them are coming from Russia. So how do people get hit by WannaCry? Well, they didn't do anything to get hit. Typically, we can blame the users when something bad happens, like stupid users following links, stupid users giving their passwords to every field that asks for it. Stupid users executing attachments. With WannaCry, it was a remote exploit. You did nothing. You could be away from your computer and it would still get infected. So whatever we do, we can't blame the users for the WannaCry incident. And that may also makes it unusual because the typical ransomware cases we look at look like this. Somebody in your human resources department receives a job application. A job application from Cameron R. Chandler in this case. Very nice resume. It even has active content. This resume has active content. Please click enable content. Let's click enable content and you get his education history and you get infected. Because this button, enable content button, is the button you should never click. I have friends who work at Microsoft and I've told them that they should rename this button. They should rename it from enable content to infect my system. <laughs> so if there's one thing I want you to remember out of RVASEC 2017, I want that to be don't click enable content. Clicking enable content will execute macros, which means running a binary with your user rights. Well, it runs a macro which can create a binary and execute it with your user rights. 
And that's unique about ransom trojans. Ransom trojans don't need to elevate rights. A keylogger or a botnet needs to stay persistent on your system. For example, it needs to survive a reboot, which means they can't survive a reboot if they only have end user privileges. They have to elevate their rights, either by tricking the user into allowing it or having some kind of an exploit. Ransom trojans don't. Ransom trojans only require access to your files the files that you can access with your rights. Because it's going to encrypt your files. And they don't need to survive reboot. They just encrypt the files and leave a message behind. them. You reboot the machine, you're clean. But your files are encrypted and you have a text file explaining to you how to get your files back. So over the years, we've investigated many of these ransom Trojan gangs. And we've communicated with them. Like we've infected our, our test systems and we've uh, pretended to be victims ourselves. And one thing we've learned is that if you decide to pay a ransom, and we don't recommend anybody to pay a ransom, but if you decide to pay the ransom, the thing you should do is to haggle. They almost always are willing to negotiate the prices. We've actually, we have a paper out on this. We, we negotiated with 18 different gangs, pretending to be victims. Uh, 15 of them were ready to like, you know, negotiate a good price. They're businessmen. In some cases, they're even willing to let your files back for free. Some of you might have seen discussion with a victim for, who got hit by Thundercrypt in Taiwan and then complains to the attackers that he don't have the money. And the attackers are actually nice guys. Look, okay, this company has been a total failure. We can't get any money out of your country. <laughs> so why don't you just have the files for free? It's okay. They actually... Uh, Give the files back for free, but you know, why don't you could have put good words for us if you can? And <laughs> it's hard to be angry at these guys when they're so nice. <laughs> so what's the mega trend? Mega trend that made all of this possible? Well, it's this one. Cryptocurrencies and Bitcoins. Of course, Bitcoin isn't bad. Bitcoin is just a tool. Bitcoin is just like cash in the real world. By the way, I had an interesting episode on Monday. On Monday, I was in London. Um, this photo you see here of physical Bitcoins. Uh, as you know, you can convert virtual Bitcoins into physical Bitcoins by printing the uh, private key of one virtual coin on a hologram. This is a hologram here. That's the beginning of a private key printed in the center of it. So it converts virtual Bitcoins into physical, which is... The only reason to do this really is that if you're like investing into Bitcoin and you're worried about them getting hacked and stolen, you can buy physical Bitcoins and put them in a safe, which means they can't be hacked from you because now they're physically in a safe place. So Monday I was in London for BBC. They were shooting a, a, a show called Horizon and they, they were asking me to explain stuff, including Bitcoin. And they told me, could, could I bring some Bitcoin with me so they could actually shoot them on, 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 uh, on, on the show? Um, and this photo here, th these are my Bitcoins. I bought a stack of physical Bitcoins four years ago when Bitcoin was valued at $40. $40. So I have a 25 Bitcoin coin. Anybody wants to buy my 25 Bitcoin coin? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you where it is. But it's valuable. It's like, anybody do the math? 2,800 by 25, 60, 70,000. It's a lot of money. That was a good investment, right? So I didn't bring my 25 Bitcoin coin to UK for the shoot, but I did bring that. That's a five Bitcoin coin, and then a one Bitcoin coin, and some stuff like that. And it was an interesting experience, because when I arrived to Heathrow, um, I realized I have to take the red line at the customs. So I walked to the red line. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm carrying monetary instruments worth more than $10,000 on me. What should I do? And they're like, okay, sure. Like, like, what do you have? Well, I have Bitcoin. You have what? <laughs> Let me get a guy. And he gets a guy. And I explain it again. He's like, really? You have Bitcoin on you? And you're walking to the red line? Let me get a guy. And he gets another guy. I do the same sing, sing and dance three times. Then they ask me, okay, okay, let's, let's figure this out. Did you fill in any paperwork about this when you left the country before arriving to UK, when you were in the country that you left? Said, no, I didn't. And they're like, oh, excellent. You may go. Please go. <laughs> J 
just for the record, I don't have them on me anymore. I've le left them home, so don't steal my bag. But these cryptocurrencies have created the market for ransomware. They've also created the market for targeted hackings, like cases where organizations are hacked, their, let's say, customer database is stolen, and then they get a threatening message that, you know, we're going to leak this unless you pay us. And of course, the payment is always done in, in Bitcoin. But one thing we've learned of these targeted cases is that these guys have no idea how much money they should be asking. Like in this case, they're asking for uh, 0 to 15 Bitcoin, and got, you know, a thousand, thousand dollars or something like that. In other cases, they're asking for millions of dollars. So clearly, they have no idea how valuable this data is. And this is going to change. It's going to change next May. It's going to change on May 24th, 2018. Because on May 24th, 2018, European Union general data protection regulation will come into effect. And I know it's an EU law. So it only applies to companies operating in EU and companies operating outside EU if they handle personal information of EU citizens, which means every company on the planet, every US company is under GDPR as well. And GDPR regulation sets lots of rules about how to handle information and it sets fines. So if you lose customer information and you didn't take proper care of it, you can be fined. Your company can be fined up to 4% of your global revenue. That's a lot of money. Imagine Google getting hit by this or something like that. So this creates a price level, right? Next May, a company gets hacked. Their customer database is stolen. Then their CFO gets an email from the hackers. Hello, we hacked your customer database. We have it right here. It wasn't protected very well at all. Now we're going to leak it on Pastebin unless you pay us, I don't know, 2% of your global revenue. <laughs> right? Am I right? It's going to happen. I mean, this creates, and now they know how valuable the data is because there's a price point, the price point created by GDPR. So let's speak about the next revolution a little bit. I told you anything that we will connect to the electricity grid, we will be connecting to the internet grid. And when I speak with people about the problems we've seen with IoT devices, a very typical reaction I get is that, yeah, that sucks, but I'm not going to play part. I don't want to be part of the IoT revolution. I will not be buying any IoT appliances to my house. And that's something you will not be able to do. You will not get a, get a chance to avoid it. Nobody's going to ask you. In 10, 15 years, the only kind of devices you can buy to your home will be IoT devices, whether you know it or not. And this is going to happen because data is the new oil. You've heard this, data is the new oil. So have heard, I mean, the companies that make appliances have heard this as well. So today, when we think about IoT, we think about washing machines, which will send you a pop-up message to your phone that the clothes are clean. You know, there's a feature for the end user, some, some benefits for the end user from the fact that it, it's online. But very quickly, we will see things like IoT toasters. And clearly, toasters don't need the internet. I mean, you don't need a pop-up notification that the, the toast is done. Right? <laughs> you don't. But they will, I, I claim they will still be online, but they won't be going online to give benefits to the consumer. They will be going online to give benefits to the manufacturer. Because the price of putting that thing online is going to be so cheap that the benefits don't have to be very big. And the benefits will be analytics. Because the toaster manufacturer wants to know who are their customers? Where are their customers? Where in the world are they? How often do they toast? What kind of a bread do they toast? What time of day? How often do we have failures? 
Do we have customers in Richmond? Do we have more customers on the west side of Richmond or on the east side of Richmond? And if we have less customers on the east side, maybe we should advertise more on the east side. This is valuable information. It's not very valuable for one user, but it's probably more valuable than the price of that chip, which is going to be two cents as time passes. So you won't even know that your toaster is an IoT toaster. And it might not be going online through your Wi-Fi. It might be going online using low RA or um, 5G or LTEM or any of these upcoming technologies. Everything will be online. And that means many things. One thing it will mean is that in the future, whenever we take new appliances into use, we have to start lying every time. Because the biggest lie on the internet is that I have read and I agree with the end user license agreement. <laughs> and you will have to accept an end user license agreement in the future with every appliance because they, they, they will all be computers and they will all collect and send out data. And we know that people lie when they click yes because we tested this. We set up a free Wi-Fi hotspot called F-Secure Free Wi-Fi. And you got free internet access. All you had to do is to accept our terms of service, in which we ask for your firstborn child. <laughs> and if you don't have a child, we'll take your pet. And everybody clicked OK. So. These IoT things, I mean, the, the revolution really started from factories. It started from ICS, industrial control systems. They were the first ones to go online. Now everything in our homes are getting online. And the risks we see, there's two different kinds of risks. One is exposed admin interfaces. What that means is that you set up some kind of a automation gear or IoT gear and only you are supposed to be able to configure it, but you mangle it so that anybody is able to configure it. And we find these regularly. When you scan the internet with Shodan or with Riddler, which is our search engine for things like this, especially with VNC, you'll regularly find factories which are exposing their interfaces with no username and password. So here's a steel mill somewhere in Germany, or actually somewhere in Austria, I believe, with 24,000 kilos of steel at the temperature of 1215 degrees Celsius. And I know these are European, but that's a lot of steel at a very high temperature. <laughs> and you can go and start clicking at the buttons because there's no password. And that's a bad idea. Or we find pump stations, or we find home automation systems. And here's a tip for you. If you are running an IoT security camera to monitor the state of your plant, Put a password on it. <laughs> That's the tip. Free tip. Is it legal in, in Virginia? No? OK. Put a password on it. <laughs> if you find these interesting or funny, you totally should follow Dan Tentler on Twitter. This, V-I-S-S. -S. He <laughs> keeps finding these regularly. Smart yacht. Hmm. I actually coined a law around this smart thing. The law is that if something is smart, it's vulnerable. So here is a smart phone, a vulnerable phone. Smart watch, vulnerable watch. Smart car, smart city, smart grid. Oh, you get the point. And this is, of course, a very general statement, a very pessimistic statement. But we do keep finding vulnerabilities from IoT things. At the worst of it, vulnerabilities which actually will let outsiders in through the IoT devices. So you have a secure network, and the weakest link in the network is a goddamn light bulb. <laughs> so your firewalls are OK, your routers are OK, your workstations are OK, but then a light bulb is connected to your internal Wi-Fi, and it leaks the credentials to anybody on the street. I mean, this, this is the, the, the perfect example of the weakest link. And the worst part is that in many organizations, the IT department doesn't even know that somebody brought in an IoT coffee machine to the office and hooked it up to the corporate Wi-Fi. This is one of the headaches we see. 
So anything we plug into the electricity grid, we will plug into the internet. In some cases, we will be plugging things to the internet which we traditionally didn't even plug into the electricity grid. And to de demonstrate this, I will show you a smart mattress. And you heard me right. This is a smart mattress manufactured by a company in Spain. And I hear you wonder why on earth would you need to put your mattress on the internet? Well, they put in sensors in the mattress. So when you are out of your home, you have an app and they will send you a warning to your mobile phone if your mattress is being used in an inappropriate <laughs> way. Like that. I know it looks like it's from The Onion, but it's real. This is not a joke, it is a real product. And of course, it's being ma manufactured in Spain, of all countries. I'm surprised it's not made in Italy, it's made in Spain. It's a prime example of engineers who were too busy thinking, how can we do this, to stop and think about if they should do this. Another example of um, vulnerabilities in IoT devices, this is from a dishwasher. This particular dishwasher had, this was found just uh, last month, it has a web server directory traversal vulnerability, which means when you connect to the web server on the dishwasher and you throw this get statement, you can steal the passwords. Let me repeat the beginning of my last sentence. When you connect to the web server on your dishwasher. <laughs> what the hell? But this is the world that we've come to. So the question really is that, I mean, is this going to apply to everything? Is everything going to be running all this? And, and it totally seems so. So for example, if you look at the, uh, the manual of, of new cars, let's say Mercedes, they actually have uh, GPL statements in the Mercedes car. And you can see, you know, they're running drop beer on S-Class. They are running drop beer on S-Class Mercedes. I had no idea. And this means our cars are computers. They've become data centers on four wheels. I was chatting with Charlie Miller a couple of weeks ago. We were both in Oslo, Norway. And he was speaking about, um, he, he, there was a conference and he got a keynote about car hacking. And later on we were chatting and he said that he read from somewhere that Chrysler recall that they had to do because of the, the work of Charlie and Chris Wallasek. He saw a quote somewhere that it cost Chrysler $14 billion. And then Charlie said that, you know, they could have just paid me and Chris $10 billion and we would have shut up. <laughs> and they would have saved $4 billion. When people think about car hacking, they typically think about things like evil hackers hacking my car, disabling my brakes and driving me off the road and killing me which is not going to happen. Because hackers don't want to kill people. It's also illegal to kill people. The kind of attack that we should worry about are the things that make sense, the things where the attacker benefits somehow. So for example, turning self-driving cars into self-stealing cars. How's that? Like you wake up in the morning and your self-driving car has disappeared. Clearly, that's going to happen, of course, because that's, that, that makes perfect sense. Why wouldn't the existing car theft gangs migrate into hacking? Because that, that's much more beneficial for them, and they don't have to break windows to steal your cars. And the fact that cars are data centers also means that our cars have to be patched and updated. Sometimes it's a little bit worrying when you realize that you are driving somewhere and your car is updating its, its systems. But it also makes me wonder how long will the cloud backends for all of these connected things be there? Like when you buy a car, you expect it to work for quite a while. I'm driving an 18-year-old car right now. I expect to drive it for at least 10 more years. So when you buy a car which requires a cloud service, will the cloud service be there in 30 years? Like is somebody still paying the bills for Amazon AWS for that particular instance in 30 years? That's a great question, isn't it? Will it be getting security updates? Will it be getting patches? We can't, obviously we can't maintain Windows XP anymore. Windows XP is from 2001, 16 years old. My car is older than XP. XP is out of support for three years. 
How are we going to solve this? And even better question, how will these things fail when the cloud backends go away? Like, will they fail open or will they fail closed? And we saw a great example of that in March when Amazon S3 storage platform was down for a couple of hours. I was on Twitter just monitoring like what people were complaining, like what didn't work because Amazon was down. Typically, it was like mobile apps or some websites which didn't work. But then this guy was complaining because he couldn't turn off his oven. Like, you can't turn off your oven because Amazon is down. <laughs> what? And these problems remind me of this. VCR, playing VHS tapes. Because we all used to have these in our living rooms. In your living room, you have, you'd have a big TV and then underneath a VCR. And you would go to any of your friend's house, they would have a big TV and a VCR. And the display of the VCR at your home and at every home was always displaying the same thing. It was always blinking 12 o'clock. <laughs> Am I right? I'm right. Why was it blinking 12 o'clock? Because when you plug it in, it doesn't know what time it is. And now it expects you to go and read the manual. Because the manual explains to you how to set the time. And we never did it. And this is what we're doing with our IoT devices. We go and buy an IoT security camera, and we bring it home, and we unbox it, and we put it on the wall, and then we go and install the app to our smartphones, and we pair the phone to the camera, and we configure it, and we get the video feed. It works. It works. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. <laughs> so we never read the manual page. 80 on the manual of the camera would explain to you how to change the default credentials. Page 85 would explain to you how to segment your network. So you have the feed on one part of the network and the admin interface on the other part. But we never do that, do we? And this is part of the problem. So is anybody doing this right? A friend of mine, a hacker friend of mine, was uh, maybe two months ago, he was shopping at Ikea. And he bought himself a couple of new light bulbs. Light bulbs called Trodfri. And as all Ikea products, the names are Swedish. Trodfri means free of cables. And this is an IoT light bulb system from Ikea. It comes with a mobile app, and you can turn off your lights from your phone. And this friend of mine, when he, when he was driving home with the system, he was sort of chuckling to himself. That, oh my god. IKEA IoT system, this is going to be horrible. Like, I'll go and check what, what's inside. It's going to be really bad, isn't it? And he installed it and looked at it. And it wasn't bad. It was actually very good. First of all, it wasn't running some three versions old Linux kernel. It was running a limited real-time operating system which wasn't running any services, which had no open TCP ports, which was listening to one UDP port but would only listen to authenticated traffic. Everything else would be dropped on the floor. Code updates were signed with a long key. I mean, it was well done. It's almost surprising, isn't it? I mean, you wouldn't think that IKEA, IKEA is the company leading the way to secure IoT. Because <laughs> you would think IKEA is the place where you buy cheap stuff, like especially the meatballs. And I've actually been in touch with IKEA since. I've spoken with their guys. Uh, turns out I knew a couple of the guys they had hired. They've built a really top-notch, world-class security team which has built this. And that's a bit surprising. I, and I don't really know why they've decided to do this, but I have a theory. Because the business model of IKEA is that everything is really cheap, so margins are really thin. But they still make a lot of money because they sell millions and millions of the same product all over the world. The margins are very thin, but they sell the same product all over the world, and they sell them for a decade. That's how they make their money. And if that's your business model, the worst thing that can happen to you is a product recall. Like if you at any time in the future have to take the product back, that's going to kill all of your profits for a decade to come. 
So whatever you do, make sure you never have to recall the product. And if that's your business model, then this makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense to in invest money in the beginning to build a secure platform, which you can then use in multiple different products for a long, long, long time to come. And you never have to do a recall because it's secure from the beginning. And that makes sense. But it is the exception to the rule. Most IoT gear, most home appliances connected to the internet right now are awful. And the reason why they are awful is that cybersecurity is not a selling point for washing machines. Cybersecurity is not a selling point for washing machines. When you go buying a washing machine, you don't ask questions about what kind of host intrusion prevention system you have. <laughs> you ask questions like, how much is it? Or, you know, how many pounds of clothes can it wash? That's what we ask. And if that's the reality, then the vendors in general would be stupid if they would invest money into security, because that's going to just make the product more expensive, and nobody's asking for the security. The only logical re reason to do it is the business model decisions like we have here with IKEA. And we've been looking at this ourselves for quite a while. For the last two and a half years, we've been building something we believe will bring better IoT security into our homes. We actually shipped it two weeks ago. This is our product. It's a small box you bring into your home, which will then create a secure, restricted Wi-Fi network just for your IoT devices. So you have your existing Wi-Fi network for your computers and phones, and then you have this separated network for your TVs and PlayStations and stuff like that. So let me finish by saying a few words about, yes, about the cyber arms race. I think it's quite remarkable that Russia tried affecting the outcome of the presidential elections in the biggest superpower on the planet. <laughs> but this is what happened. We've seen this reported many times. We saw this reported in the media just a couple of days ago, uh, especially in The Intercept. And just to be clear, I'm not going to show you any classified material. So if there are people with clearances in the audience, no need to leave. So these reports that we saw are quite remarkable. But I think it's even more remarkable when you see how President Putin has been commenting on these cases. In particular, last October, Bloomberg interviewed President Putin. And in that interview, I mean, this was before the elections. In that interview, they asked the key question, Mr. Putin, who hacked the Democrats? And he answers. His answer, is that really important? Does it even matter who hacked it? The important thing is the content of the emails. There's no need to distract the public about who did it. There's no need to distract the public about who did it. And then last week, he gave an interview um, on the same topic. Let's listen. Hackers are like painters. Hackers are in good mood. Hackers are in good mood. Там что-то происходит в международных отношениях. Если они настроены патриотически, они начинают вносить свою лепту, как они считают правильную, в борьбу с теми, кто как бы плохо отзывается о России. Ну и возможно, теоретически возможно. Yes, theoretically, it's possible. Hackers are like artists, and Russia has no control over what these artists might be willing to do regarding elections in superpowers across the ocean. But, like I said earlier, we can trace back almost all of the problems we have today to the fact that, yes, data is the new oil. And this comparison isn't new, but I think it's a great comparison. If you look at the largest oil companies on the planet, their revenue is typically smaller than revenue of Google. And Google makes all of their money from data. So in that sense, data is absolutely the new oil. Also, when you think about oil, when you, when you pump crude oil out of, the, out of the land, that crude oil is obviously valuable, but you can't do anything without it until you refine it. And exactly the same thing applies to raw data. Raw data is obviously valuable, but you can't do anything with it until you refine it. 
And oil has brought the mankind huge amounts of prosperity and huge amounts of problems. Exactly in the same way data will bring us prosperity and it will bring us problems. If you work with oil, you have to worry about oil leaks. If you work with data, you have to worry about data leaks. Our work matters. Your work matters. People come to us with problems that they can't solve. And we can solve it because this is our area. And of course, it's a job. We all go and do this because we get paid to do it. But it's a little bit more than a job. We all could do anything. We could go and you know, write programs, write games or whatever, CRM systems. And we've decided to work in security. And working in security, in some ways, it's a service because we help others. So thank you for your work. And if there's one thing you're going to remember out of RVA SEC 2017, that's going to be please don't click enable content. <laughs> thank you very much.